And we will also, in our discussion, or in our lecture, link a bit the organ art in West and Eastern Europe. And uh, Christoph, can you give an explanation of what kind of picture we see here? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to say that the task given to us is not easy, and everybody will probably speak very much from his own experience, and just we are going to give some general remarks and of course, the examples that will be presented will be taken very much from our, I should say, environments. So, well, actually, what you can see is a picture. Uh, well, actually, it's it's a copy, a 19th century copy of a much older painting, showing one of the churches in my city, in Krakow. It's the Dominican church, and it's the state before the great fire of the city, which was in 1850, approximately. And you can see two organs, both were actually Renaissance organs. In the choir, this tiny object on a small balcony over here. And then it was made in 1534. And a much uh, greater organ in the background of the main, main balcony. So that's just an ornament to the first um, slide. And let us now speak about the um, structure or the speech. So there is going to be a very uh, short introduction very subjective, everybody is going to have his own views on that, about the era of the Renaissance. Then uh, a few words about the general idea of music and the sound aesthetics and the great changes that uh, the societies could experience within the sphere of music in the 16th century. Then evolution of the sound and the last point is going to be about the way such an organ would be used so, registrations and a little bit of yeah. historic substance and sources. Yeah, we see a, a, a number of, of photographs. Christoph, can you explain who are depicted here and what was their role and function in your view of the, the Renaissance? Well, I would say most of us is going to recognize the faces. So, so we, uh, we start left with a figure that introduced some new literary concepts, actually, at the very final years of the medieval time, which is, I mean, it's Dante, obviously. Then you have Copernicus, who was one of the first to, to actually defend the idea that, that it is not the sun going around the earth, but the other way around. Then you have, of course, Michelangelo, uh, sorry, Leonardo, who, who would be also a great mind, and he would make an atomic uh, discoveries and he would be designing new machines and, and, and objects to be used. In the military context then you have uh, the great, great painter and sculptor Michelangelo and there's also Galileo at the very end who would be actually operating within a very similar context to Copernicus and such people also uh, I would say took part in, in great developments of the Renaissance time, and of course, now we go to the row below, starting with great geographic um, discoveries, and then, of course, the arrival of, of music, prints, and it would be, in the first line, Venice that would be responsible for, for the publications and, and for spreading of material. And finally, we just added one, one more uh, picture that should actually symbolize the, the new ideas of the society and of a perfect city, and there would be examples of such cities in Italy, in the first line, who would be constructed, so to say, from scratch, from the zero point, and they would be designed in the most perfect way, trying to fulfill all the needs and necessities of the society of that time. And then there is also something that should be said about the music of that time. Yeah, it is interesting that the previous page uh, was connected with people who are stemming from Italy. So one of the centers of the Renaissance was, was Italy, of course. But it's interesting, if we move to music, that we move automatically to the north, and also especially to the, to the low countries, uh, for example, southern Netherlands, the place where we are now. And you see to the left side, uh, Dufay. Then the next one is Josquin d'Apré, a very important composer of, they are all making most of the time vocal music. 
also Orlando di Lasso is the third one, and the last one is in, in, in San Marco in Venice. It's uh, uh, Gabrieli, Giovanni Gabrieli, very well known family for developing the, the double choir music. And well, related to the organ, it's good to, to remember that the, the oldest organ music is of course uh, vocal music which was performed on the organ and perhaps to, to, to support uh, the, the choir in the beginning and then at a certain moment the choir was absent but they need this motet in, in, in the mass so the organist had to play the vocal notes and after playing it once without anything else he thought well this is boring let me add something and then the so-called interpolations started and well this is based on um, most of the time for example uh, Orlando di Lasso or the Lassus had a very, very famous uh, uh, Mardigal, Suzanne un jour, and it was well spread over Europe and uh, uh, with, with diminutions by, by many different composers. There's even uh, an old version in the <coughs> Susanna van Zolt book from the, from the Netherlands, and also pieces by Josquin. And later on, I will show you an uh, interpretation of Adieu mes amours in my lecture uh, based on Josquin Montet. Well, yes, so basically there is that moment of transition from the purely or mainly vocal um, idiom to more and more sophisticated and independent instrumental music. And the same would be actually visible in the development of, of organ as such. Yeah, here we see not an old organ, but it's based on the oldest preserved organ in the Netherlands. And that's the instrument and I have to take care of is Rijn sitting next to me. The case is now in Middelburg, but the origin of uh, that organ was the Klaaskerk in Utrecht, the Nicolai Church. And that is the oldest organ. It was built in uh, 1479 by Peter Gerritsson. And in the Orgelpark in Amsterdam, they had made a copy. And that copy is done by the firm Rijl. And the interesting thing is that in this instrument, you see the original shape of the main case. And if you know, and later you will see the picture of the present case, then you will see that the middle tower is now a pointed tower, but this was the original, it was flat, and you see very beautiful in the, in the design yeah, that there is a, a grate and an oberwerk, and the grate is still having the middle age blockwerk, so you cannot divide the different principal stops, so you always have the plain sound, and Jan van Kovelens, who made the organ in Alkmaar, called this blockwerk sound the principal, so the most important sound. You can imagine, organ in the 14th century was always typicalized with, with that term, the most important. And you see here in the bovenwerk that there is also a sort of blockwerk, but there you can split off three different sounds. So this is in fact a little the beginning of the first Renaissance uh, uh, aspects. And you see that the organ is having an extremely low pitch. Uh, if we see it with baroque eyes, we would say it is Paris chamber tone, 388. And there is one thing which is a bit uh, discussed. Uh, the organ is now in mean tone, and probably that is not the original temperament. It was in Pythagorean temperament, and they are discussing also to bring that in that instrument, but I think, I don't know if they have made a decision about it. Yes, and we continue with this uh, quote, which is about the old idea of the sound. And I think Peter is going to refer to that again. Yeah, because we are in Belgium, in the southern Netherlands, and we are in Deuven, I thought it's interesting to have uh, an example of, of the, the, the Middle Age organ. Uh, this was an organ uh, made uh, for the chapel of the priest seminar, uh, 1455, 1445, and you see here the, the original text from the contract. Unfortunately, the, the organ itself is not preserved, but here you see that there is a small blockwerk uh, presented without the possibility of changing sound. And according to Jan van Biesen, who made a very good study of the Renaissance organ in the Netherlands, um, the, the, the double choir principle uh, had the second choir 
at the rear side and the, 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 the front side was of tin and the rear side the principle was of lead. And this is a, a typical example of uh, a block work which is not very very strong. You, you see how many how many choirs it had. And this is the, the still the old fashion, so to say. Yes, and then we go to the moment of the advent of the new sound that have never been heard before. So in Antwerp there was made a contract with a German organ builder Hans Saus from Cologne. And uh, he's mentioning different sounds, and especially the last line is, is for our, our talk today very, very important. He is he's mentioning all the different sounds, and then he's saying, and the nog meer andere zeldzame stemmen die nooit in Orgelen gehoord geweest en zijn. So uh, there are uh, rare voices that have never been built and heard in organs, and you see also names of, of stops, and well, the first line is for me not 100% sure, we, we know that Dove was the name for the principal in the prospect, and that means in fact Dove of, or Def, and that is the first step of making change in sound from the blockwerk was to close the so-called position, and the position are all the yeah. higher choirs, and then you kept a uh, uh, a dof, a deaf sound. Uh, it, it's 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 also said it's it's like the fl uh, like a flute. And then you see other other names, uh, for example, wegelen. Jan van Biesen sings that it's a schwegel, uh, a uh, high flute too. And with the waldhorn, they don't think of a flute, but they think of a of a normal flute, but of a nazar to the third. And the schilpijp is another name for the quintadeen. The Quinta de Eight, and then they mention reed stops like trumpets, schalmeien, zinken, ruispijpen, and also tambourijnen. And we have some beautiful pictures of what the tambourijn was. Here you see two um, specifications from the Netherlands, and you see also two specifications from the East. And uh, the first one is, uh, made, was made in Leuven, in Sint Vintinus, by Jan van Lier, 1522. And you see four stops. And uh, there are, of course, a number of possibilities possible. Right? You had a sort of, of principal, a sort of blockwerk sound. It's the dove and the position. There was a stopped flute. We don't know if that was only a flute or also part of the principle uh, that you could combine the dove and the stopped flute. And there is a symbol, and then seventy years later we have a contract with Antwerp Saint Jacob, uh, made by Willem van Laren. And I have chosen this example because, in my view, this organ uh, stop list is very close to what we have in with what we had in Leuven with Crinon, and special attention also to the pitch of the rug positive you see that there is, as far as we know, there is an eight-foot pitch totally missing, and that means that many ensembles were made on the basis of four-foot in the Renaissance time. A beautiful sounding example of this we find in Innsbruck, in the, the famous Ebert organ in the Hofkirche, where the complete rug positive has no eight-foot, but it has a principal four and a flute four as lowest stops. And yeah, you can imagine that out of these stops you can make an enormous number of, of different registrations and Mr. Willem van Laren has also given lists with 26 possibilities to make uh, a variety of, of, uh, of, of sounds and you see to the right side the, all the reed stops, in the middle part you see the, the flutes and the cymbal, in, in the Netherlands the flutes and the cymbal were always connected with each other and on the left side you see all the stops belonging to the principal chorus, so stemming from the so-called blockwerk. And Christoph, how was yes. that in Poland? Well, I would say that this idea to, to have new kind of sounds, not only this organ um, uh, sounds, but some kind of imitative um, sonorities would not really be reserved to the low countries. And uh, of course one could discuss it, to which extent and whether they have 
being some influences, but apparently in many parts of the world, also in, in Germany, uh, there would be a common goal to achieve more sounds than just a principal sound. And I'm quoting two examples, I think they have not been discussed in this context this far. Um, both cathedrals in, uh, in Płock and in Gniezno are still in existence and there were buildings uh, created for the first time in the 12th century, then of course remodeled many times. And um, the first one, the Płock, um, uh, had always had two organs, and this is the stopless of the smaller one, which is documented only partly. So out of 12 stops, only seven are known. But you can already see that there was this curiosity in creating multiple constructions. You have two types of flutes, probably one was a lower one, and the other one was responding one at the fire. Then you have a stopped uh, voice, which is principally spontovani. Then you have a reed, zinc, which, is, which was very well known also here. Then you have a chimney flute and two, two kinds of um, the mixture. And the other organ is um, maybe even more interesting because um, it's the mid-16th century object and it has a pedal division already actually astonishingly um, rich in its stops. And you have also, well, maybe not a profusion, but you have a certain choice of, um, of reeds in the pedal. You have the eight and the two foot um, trumpet. The Rauschpfeife would be present under this strange name, Rosspfeife, which is obviously a changed German name. And now, now I would like to go back to, to the left column, because there is that stop which is named Trom. Which, is, which would be a trommel in German, Pauten. It's just a drum stop, and the next picture is going to show some examples of that. So, to the left. That is uh, the, the, the second choir organ in Alkmaar, and it's uh, depicted by Peter Sandredam, the church painter, in the 1660s, in a time that this organ case was already empty. In the large Van Hagenstiedke organ, there are some stops still preserved of this instrument. And the most important is the, the, the tambourin or the, or the drum stop. And that are the two pipes at the pillar. And you see in the length that they are almost having the same length. And that was giving, if you use that stop, a sort of drumming uh, effect. And that effect was not only uh, present in, in, in Western Europe, but also in the East. Yes, so this is a preserved example, and there are more of them, sometimes rather extreme. There is one organ which I'm going to show later on, which has on, on each side five such open pipes. And this is Olkusch. Um, this is the 16 foot D and E. They're just located on the next pillars in relation to the organ balcony and connected with the organ by means of a very large, approximately 12 meter wind trunks. And and they really do create a, a strong effect. Yes, and now we continue with this example, which is actually another step of evolution of the organ that has already been, already been shown. Yeah, here you see the instrument from the Nikolai Church in the present state in Middelburg, in the Korkerk. And uh, you see, in fact, two worlds together. You see in the, in the grid, uh, it was still a blockwerk in 1547, and the renovation by Cornelis Gerritsson, the son of uh, Gerrit Pietersson, uh, and probably this, this man studied with Jan van Kovelens. So he kept in the Hoofdwerk the old situation, but he created in his two other manuals the Renaissance uh, options. And you see in the different rows, you first see the, the, the principal chorus and very obvious is that in the Bovenwerk there is just one principle with no blockwerk sound and in the Rugpositive you have the complete blockwerk, in fact the four stops we see in the Rugwerk are also uh, still present in Alkmaar, so you make the, the principal, the blockwerk sound with these four stops. And then you have the second row are the, 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 is the flute choir and the third are the, are the reed stops. And you see the pointed tower, and a special thing of this prospect, which is very typical for the Dutch organ building, 
are the mirror fields, so the double choirs in, in the dove, Brug positive, and then the pipe feet are together and they have just one conduct, and then these pipes are, 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 are dubbing and very for a very intensive sound. Yes, yeah, so and now let's let's compare this to, to what happens some 1,000 kilometers to the east of that geographical point. And this is some information that I already presented for the first time in Mölln just last year, wasn't it? Yeah. When the Jakob Scherer organ was inaugurated. And uh, actually, the same organ builder, the father of the, the great dynasty of North German organ builders, who sent the second generation actually to, to Niehoff for, for studies, he was also active in the city of Stettin. Um, it's today in, in Western Poland. And um, the city also had a very large Schnitke organ later on, and in St. Mary's, Jakob Scherer uh, created an organ uh, which uh, has a very um, extensive documentation, still preserved in the, in the city archives, you can see it here, and this is a stop list. So um, maybe let's start with the compasses, because it's a transition from the F organ to the C organ. There are not very many examples of, of, of this kind of compass. We know that Lödingbord used to have this compass at the time of Antonius Wilde, and we also have one organ which still has this compass. It's even more to the east, not very far from <coughs> Danzig, which is which used to be Danzig. So if you play in the uh, in primo modo, it's obviously useful to have a low D. And what you can see is that in the great, not only the principles are represented, but gradually more and more flutes would be welcome and perhaps the local organists would have um, a desire not only to play the plenum or the diapason sound, but the real richness of possibilities is um, available on the repositive, where you have, of course, the, the plenum, perhaps the, the, the three rank symbol was, was already a Rauschenwitz symbol, maybe quad six, we don't know that, but then you have a profusion of flutes and of reeds, and of course, already a rather free pedal division. And there are registration for uh, the, the, the suggestions left by Scher himself, which I'm going to refer to just in a few minutes. Yeah, we have to come a bit to an end, uh, yes. Christoph, so we will make it short. Uh, this is uh, a contract from Daniel van der Disselen from Antwerp, and uh, you see two um, interpretations, so to say, of the, of the text written above. And the first one, the left one, is from uh, Martin Albert Fente in Die Brabant of Orgo. And the right one is the interpretation of Jan van Biesen. And you see that there, is, uh, there are quite many differences uh, of combinations, because this is in the, in the contract you see the, the possibility of combinations. And Fente is interpreting the text that there is a flute for, and Jan van Biesen is saying no. That is not the meaning of the flute four, but it's an octave two. And that the dove you could never close. Eh? So there is no possibility to have an ensemble based on four foot on this manual, but it's always based on eight foot. And the last one, actually, uh, is the first of Shera, and he left quite a lot of registrations. It's just a small choice of that. There are six pages of that left by him. So first he's referring to the very classic and conservative plenum, which, is, which consists of flue stops exclusively, but you always should have the, the 16 foot untersatz of the pedal, which should actually always be the, when you play the stops of the grade. And for the rig positive, you can see that there was a desire to have a, some, a kind of exotic sounds with a combination of principal and symbol, or for instance, the three reeds together. And now there's a conclusion which is only one sentence that you can read, actually, and that would be the thoughts behind. Thanks for your attention.